We are live. This is Value After Hours. I'm Tobias Carlisle, joined as always by my co-host, Jake Taylor. Our special guest today is Dan Rasmussen of Verdad. How are you, Dan? Great. It's great to be here with you guys, and especially with Jake's pink sweater. <laughs> Welcome, Dan. Off on, the, off on the right foot. Dan, <laughs> uh, you've been on the show before, but for folks who for folks who don't know, why don't you just give us a brief outline of who you are and, and what, what, what is for Dad? What are you yeah, doing here? So, yeah, what the hell am I doing here? Uh, <laughs> Uh, 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 I guess like you guys, I, I have a, a deep and abiding interest in, in, in deep value. Um, and, uh, Condolences. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, but, uh, but for dad as hedge fund, we, we manage a little under a billion dollars and, um, the, uh, assets are spread out about a third of the money is in, uh, micro cap deep value strategies of which the majority of that money is invested in Japan. Um, which I'm always happy to chat about. Then we have a crisis strategy, which is another uh, third of our uh, capital. Um, and uh, that dumps money into the US market whenever the high yield spreads blow out past 600 basis points, which we first did during COVID. Um, and then the rest of the business is uh, high yield credit. We have a quantitative approach to high yield credit. And then we have a uh, multi-strat um, hedge fund, which uh, we just started, which is long, short factor um, strategies and multi-asset class. So that's sort of the spectrum of things that we do, um, uh, but uh, in Boston and um, yeah. I think I really enjoy all of your guys's, I read it every Monday morning when it comes out, um, all the, the research pieces that you guys put out. So I, I would just start off the show by saying everyone should sign up for that if they want to keep up on so much better than doing reading academic papers it's just yeah. read read for dad's stream instead <laughs> thank you jake yeah we, we 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 write every monday and we try to we, we do a mix of we do a lot of our own research um and share you know what we're finding and then we summarize other people's research when it's good and interesting um and uh and yeah i, I was just uh joking with uh jake that uh we, we've been accused of uh of um uh, educating people's biases uh that perhaps we uh we, we're too um uh, the things that we write are too confirmatory of our worldview, but I guess um, you know I think that's probably true of most most writers. So, well, welcome to the show. That's what we do. Here. <laughs> yeah, um, we change the show's name to Confirmation Bias. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> why, why don't we start after there? hours? Why don't we start there? I think you and I have fairly similar approaches in the sense that it's quantitative, deep value, uh, and you know the, the, a lot of the research is probably U.S. focused in 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 its. Uh, it began in the US anyway, just because that's the longest and best data set. Yeah. I think that the question that, that I have had and that many people have had is that value really has sort of seems to have broken down somewhere between, depends on how you're counting it, but 2010, 2015 through to 2020, perhaps. I feel like there was a little bit of a recovery late 2020. I feel like it's probably still ongoing, but certainly last year was, was weaker for deep value better for better for the growthiest stuff how do you see uh do you think that's a fair description and what do you think of the drivers what why are we where we are yeah so i i would say i think you know the the worst period was 2018 to 2020 you know the the, the value winter um where value just got decimated right and not only did value get decimated but the opposite of value worked right if you were just long you know and the, I think the sort of frustrating thing about the stuff that worked was it was sort of, um, you know, we all we all like to think we're really smart and educated and we're thinking meta analytically and we're analyzing things. And the stuff that worked was just like, you know, stuff First you order seen thinking. on TV yeah. or stuff. It was just like, yeah, I've used Zoom the other day and like that seems cool or I'm like, so maybe I should buy Zoom stock or like I've been getting so many Amazon packages like that must be a great business. Let me start like getting, you know, buying Amazon stock. Right. I mean, it was just frustrating. Right. Because you're like, well, that's not how the market's supposed to work. Right. Markets are supposed to be sort of efficient and all that stuff sort of is supposed to be priced in and, and the glamorous stuff isn't supposed to work. And um, um, and. You know, I'd like to think that like doing all this work to find some like exotic micro cap trading at half times book that nobody's ever heard of that there's like a monopoly on in some random industrial part would be rewarded. <laughs> there's some like spirit. It's got a monopoly on a screw that goes um, into a billion dollar plane. Yeah. And, and then charges 10 exactly, times for that screw. <laughs> exactly. And yet instead the opposite was true. Um, and then I think, you know, starting in and then you had, you know, in the US, you had a, a real value recovery after 2020. You know, really, no. You know, October, November of 2020 was huge, and then 
you know, 2021, 2022 were quite good um, for, for value. Um, and 2022 was great because there was like the vengeance of all of the stuff that I hate all of, like got totally obliterated. Um, and, <laughs> and, you know, like all the like they even had annoying names and annoying tickers where the tickers was actually some word like laser or something. And you're like, you know, God, this really this thing has to just burn in hell. And in 2023, <laughs> 2022, like uh, it, it really did. And then and then and then in the U.S. last year it was all about growth again, um, all about growth um, and the growthier and the crappier the growth thing was, the better it seemed to do frustratingly. Um, and I think, you know, the saving grace for us was that internationally value had a really good year. So really good year. So if you were long deep value micro caps in Europe or Japan, you had a great 2023. And a lot of the growth stuff in those countries, a lot of international growth investors had a lot of money in China, which got hammered. And so, you know, value looked pretty smart internationally. Um, so it's a little bit uh, different. But yeah, in the US, again, it felt like the deeper value you were, the more you got obliterated uh, relative to the benchmark, right? And I mean, nobody, it was hard to lose money in uh, investing in stocks uh, last year, but but relative to the benchmark value uh, underperformed last year. Probably the only place that was a little bit sad were the small and micros. H how do you feel about small and micro? Yeah. And I, I think the other thing that's worth noting is the size premium has been fairly negative, right? Um, and um, and so, and I think that, you know, when you're thinking about value, especially deep value, you're getting a bunch of factor exposures along with your value, right? If you want to own value, you're also getting small size, almost inevitably, right? Because that's where all the really cheap stuff is. You're also getting low earnings growth. You're often getting high leverage levels. Um, um, and so you're getting this other, you know, mix of factors along with it. And I think the the size factor, which is, you know, over long periods of time has been a fairly reliable winner, has also been a sharply negative. Um, and so if you've been going outside of the benchmark to own smaller things, you've been getting hammered. Uh, and I think the the smartest thing, as it turned out to have done over the last five years, right there, I think, you, you know, you, you even think of the sort of smart growth investors who all said, hey, look, the index is too overweight, like seven stocks. And the benefit we provide you as active growth managers is diversifying you out of this top heavy index. But actually, the right thing to do is to say, hey, that the index isn't top heavy enough. We should own double our benchmark weight in these five stocks. And then we're going to really kill it. That was the right answer, and no one did that. There's, I know one guy who did it, uh, but 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 almost nobody else did. Um, and so you, you had this, you've had this sharply negative size factor, which I think has also sort of unintentionally hurt a lot of value investors. Yeah, and do you feel like, I, you know, you if you want different ways of imagining reversion to the mean, and you have, you know, the last ten years of what kind of worked, and then you have the if you looked back at the last hundred years. Those things are like completely opposite of each other. Uh, what's your argument other than just purely reversion to the mean as a as a you know kind of exist existential force in the universe? Um, what what would be your thesis for why we should expect the next ten years perhaps to look more like the last one hundred and not like the 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 ten before it? Yeah. So, so I, I come back to, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a believer in reversion of the mean for reversion of the mean's sake, right? I, I think that we can go sort of on a deeper philosophical level. And my deeper philosophical level is that there's a lot we don't know about the world. And our, our vision of what we know really stops when the future starts, right? It's really hard to predict the future, really, really, really hard to predict the future. And if you're a smart quant and can go back test things, you can put in a lot of, you know, ideas and you can see how hard it is to predict the future by looking at how many of your back tests fail or like how many of your good ideas don't work right um, and I think if you think about some very simple rules um, that you might um, come up with right you might say um, uh, you know gee I think the US has outperformed last year so it should outperform next year or like US stocks always outperform right and you run that through a you just realize it's 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 not true it's too simple right I mean and I think the fundamental reason for this and why sort of value it works um, in my mind is that one of the things that's most unpredictable is future growth rates of companies. Um, future growth rates of companies are totally unpredictable, right? Now, it doesn't seem like that because we have in our mind Microsoft and Amazon and Facebook. And so we think, oh, gee, you know, this has been very stable long-term growers. Surely growth is predictable, but it really isn't. Even within the technology sector, revenue growth, earnings growth, it's just not, it's not persistent. It's not predictable. You can test that any which way, right? So if you stop and say, well, gee, 
you know, I don't know what the future is going to hold on a company level for revenue or earnings. I, I don't. I think it would be crazy for me to say I really know that the U.S. market is going to be the best performing market, or, or really to pick any region and just say, hey, that in 2024 that region is definitely going to be the best. You know, what's the logic for that, right? And you come up. I mean, you know, and and I think the same with sectors, right? So it's just really hard to sort of predict what's going to happen. Um, the with any sort of fidelity, right? And and the world is so unpredictable. And so then I think if you think about um, what that implication for that is, like if you start with a position of future nihilism and say, okay, let's assume I know nothing about the world. Uh, I absolutely know nothing and nothing is predictable and everything is totally random. Well, then if you bought a pool, a bunch of companies at five times earnings and a bunch of companies at 25 times earnings, right? A year from now, in theory, the multiples should adjust for some other random new set of expectations. And, the, and and so everything should be sort of scrambled. And if everything's scrambled, the cheap stuff's going to be much more likely to be scrambled up and the expensive stuff's more likely to be scrambled down on the random distribution. And so value is going to work because of this resorting. And I think over time, if you look, um, at, and that's how value works, right? You, you, you take the, the universe of value stocks and a decent chunk of them end up resorting you know, out of value. And that's where you make your money. And with growth stocks, a big chunk of them resort down out of growth because they, they you know, the growth doesn't live up to expectations. Um, and so I think that for me, you know, value is a um, way of betting on unpredictability of, of saying, hey, it's a it's a humble way of investing, right? You're, you're sort of saying, hey, gee, I, I think there's a lot we don't know. I think there's a lot we could be surprised by. Um, I don't think we should feel too confident in our forecasts. Um, and I think to go back to sort of the other side of the trade where people have been very confident, right? And they've been saying, hey, we, we really think that large cap U.S. tech is the place to be and it's really growing a lot and that's going to really reward equity investors. And, and the frustrating thing is that they've, they've been right. Um, and so they've felt that the world is very predictable and that that predictable predictability will continue. Um, but even if you look at the predictability of the revenue and and and, and earnings growth rates of those companies right they're they're really random they've been really high but they've been quite random they haven't been necessarily predictable um and so i think you know you come from this place where you say gee i, I don't know what's going to happen i think the world is unpredictable value is the right way to bet um and i think when it comes to thinking about um size um as an, you know i think of size as um uh, which is obviously interrelated with value but but i think you know there are a number of ways to think about that one is to think uh that um uh, you know, there are a lot more small companies than uh, large companies. There's a lot more randomness associated with it. Um, there's a lot more volatility. And so, gee, if you're taking that risk in smaller stocks, you should be more rewarded to the upside when that random occurrence happens um, than you would in a much more large, uh, stable stock. Um, and you'd think that the large, stable stock would be more efficient or less volatile than it. anyway. So I think there's an argument that taking this value risk within small caps gives you this really asymmetric set of outs. Uh, you know, and if you just keep making that bet over and over and over and again, um, you're going to be right because there's um, you're betting on a fundamental truth about the world, which is that the future is unpredictable. It just is. Um, there, you know, you can't predict the future, and 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 there are very narrow ways ways you can, but by and large, it's unpredictable. And, and value is a way to express that bet. Uh, let me give a shout out to our. Uh, we get people from around the world. We like to give them a little shout out. Peter Tikfa, Israel, Dino in Townsville. What's up, Maitland, Florida, Senator Domingo, Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Pittsburgh, Norberg, Sweden, Wool and Gabba, really? Some of Gabba, good for you. Pretty cold that, right now. <laughs> Hodge Rica, that's a tough one. Norwich, Prince George, Toronto, Miami, Florida, Chemnitz, Germany, Valparaiso, Kauai, Hawaii, or Kurosari, <laughs> Estonia, Hamburg, Germany, Vacaville, Canada, Cowtown, Ann Arbor, Colorado, Milton Keynes. Milton Keynes, I think I always get that wrong. Nashville, Tennessee. Chippewa Falls, Toronto, Brisbane. What's up? So a couple of good questions in here, uh, Dan. And then I, I also have some. Um, Trey asks, what does Dan think about the illiquidity factor versus the size factor? Some research indicates that liquid small does horribly while well, illiquid small outperforms. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that... Um... I I think it's look I, I think size and liquidity are very correlated right so where do they become uncorrelated what are like when you ask like what are the liquid small or micro caps they're almost all growth stocks right they're they're really highly traded growth stocks and so yeah they do kind of suck 
but do they suck because they're small and illiquid or like i they suck for another reason right and i think that um my view is that size and illiquidity um um, should in theory be um competitive advantages for investors that can do it because large funds can't trade in to these things and analysts aren't going to cover them so you're going into a much less efficient uh part of the market um and where very small changes can drive really big changes in outcomes so if you think about where there's the most asymmetry it should in theory be in the most small and illiquid things yeah i, I like that answer I, I think that there's um we're often measuring symptoms rather than causes and I think size itself is almost a, is probably just a, a symptom of value, but that's a little bit beside the, beside the point. Uh, here's a good question. I think this is right in your, right in your, uh, in your Bally zone. Bailiwick. Bailiwick, that's a good word. Yeah. Why would the size factor work in an environment where companies are staying private for longer than in the past and private equity buys out many of the best small micro companies? Yeah. So, so look, I think there has been a, um, change in the quality of the small cap index and we've written about this um i'd say more of the problem is actually the introduction of a lot of crap in small co- co- companies recently there's been a lot more biotech ipos and small tech growth ipos which have been really bad um, and i think there's some truth to some of the best small caps um, do end up getting acquired right um, but there's still a really big selection opportunity right so you, you know there's still I don't know, 2000 stocks in the Russell 2000 and 500 stocks in the S&P 500, right? So, you know, there are four times as many, right? I mean, in theory, that should be, you know, whatever it is that you're looking for, you should be able to find some version of it. And it's more likely that you're going to find some version of it in the small cap universe and large cap universe if you're being selective. Um, So I think that might be a good argument for saying, hey, gee, the quality of the Russell 2000 as a whole is worse, um, but is it necessarily an argument for um, stock selection within um, the small cap universe. I don't think so. Um, I think another thing that's worth noting is that private equity backed companies in particular are really low quality, as we would think of measuring quality. They tend to be really low profit margins. Um, they tend to have a huge amount of debt. They tend to be smaller than the average small cap by a lot. Um, and so you're looking at um, company, they, they do tend to grow a little bit faster. Now, some of that's inorganic, some of that's organic, but um, but you're looking at you know low margin, highly levered um, micro caps, um, um, and and recently in the past few years, private equity is really focused on two sectors: tech and healthcare. Um, so outside of that, you know the world's your oyster, and there's some sectors right, like take um, biotech or energy, where you know there's just there are many more interesting public things than there are private things. Now, if you want to buy a micro cap software company, yeah, there are no micro cap good micro cap software companies that trade you know, in the US really, right? Or, or very, very few, right? Those are all owned by private equity and maybe healthcare technology, right? But but those are the real growth tech. Those are the real sexy areas, the glamour stocks, right? That are that are being taken private and owned there. And, I, you know, would you really want to own those? I mean, I, I guess a lot of people are saying they should, that, that you want to put 40% of your money in them. But I, I take the other end of that um, uh, end of that trade. So I think it's a, it's a mixed bag. I mean, I think there's certainly truth um, to the uh, degradation in quality within small cap indices. Um, but I, I think that's more uh, um, uh, an indictment of owning the whole index rather than an indictment of stock selection, just given how many stocks there are. I'm getting flashbacks to uh, one of my favorite talks that you ever gave, which was basically dismantling private equity. Uh, <laughs> it was, and you you pulled no punches. It was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, well, they finally had a bad year. I mean, 2023 was a bad year for for private equity. It's one of the first you know times in, in recent years where. You've seen them take it take it on the chin a little bit, um, but I think the uh, y- you know you look at you know there's this like docu we were talking about in the office yesterday this DocuSign buyout is coming out right and they're going to pay I think DocuSign has like 800 million of free cash flow and they're paying I think they're putting on like eight billion of debt to finance the transaction on 800 million of cash flow and like they have all these things like DocuSign is way too much. Um, you know, way too much SG&A costs. So they're going to, you know, dramatically increase margins or, you know, whatever it is. Synergies. But like, but like you this. think of like 8 billion of debt or, or something, right? And like at 10% interest, that's like almost all the free cash flow of the business is going to debt service. Um, and are they going to get 
ten percent. I mean, maybe it's maybe it's a ten percent, eight billion at ten percent for eight hundred million of cash flow. But gee, think of the risk, right? Um, and that's like a premier, a, you know, big premier buyout um, that's happening right now. And and the bigger companies are better in quality, and they're, they're you know they have more free cash flow and they have higher margins than the smaller companies. So think of that as like a case study in what private equity is doing right now, and just say how much exposure would you want to have to that. Um, it, gee, it seems pretty risky in this environment. I don't know, right? It doesn't seem like there's a lot of room for error. It doesn't seem very humble. It doesn't seem like it's anticipating that your Excel model might not be right. If you uh, play devil's advocate on this, like let's invert it. And let, let's say that I forced you to only, you could only invest your kids' college funds in a private equity market of some kind. What strategy would you you think could actually end up doing okay over the next 10 years uh, net of fees? Yeah, well, I've always I've always thought that um, uh, that you know value times leverage is a good thing, right? If you like value and you like small cap, but then you know a marginally levered company with two or three turns of debt isn't a problem if you pay six times EBITDA for it. I I don't have an issue with that, right? Generally, a company can pay off debt, so I'm okay. Like I like old school PE, right? I think that was a great idea. It obviously, it worked really well, right? Yeah. And so I said, I'd say like, well, where can you buy? small companies that are cash flow generative um, at low prices today, like certainly Japan, right? I mean, Japan mm. is just, everything is cheap in Japan. Now everything's public in Japan too. So most of the buyouts there are, are take privates, but um, uh, but generally, yeah, you can get great bargains there. I think Europe is still decently cheaper than the US. I mean, it's it's there's uh, less capital chasing uh, deals there. Um, and then I'd say probably within the U.S. there are sectors that are left for dead. You know, the, the private equity. Um, you know, as an asset class, you, you you see the LP community react as a herd to certain things, right? And so there are a bunch of take privates that went bust in like 08, right? So then a lot of LPs said, "Please don't do take privates." And so you'd, you'd see, you you know you saw sort of a move away from take privates that lasted a few years, and then every private equity firm and their mother got really into energy in 2012 and 2013, and then got totally burned in 14 and 15. And then all the LPs said, never do energy again, you know? And so I bet there, I, you know, I, I would suspect there's a lot of interesting energy private equity deals out there. So I, you know, I think it's just a matter of, you know, where the value opportunities are. Um, and I think it's, you know, these days it's anywhere X US tech and US growth where multiples are really crazy. But, you know, the minute you get out of that, there's a huge drop off to everything else. Do you feel like that cyclicality though kind of almost makes it uh, not a good candidate for PE because inherently you're going to want to lever it up, which means you need consistent cash flows to to sort of make the math work without crashing the whole thing. Yeah, I think I think you either you have to lever it reasonably, and I think honestly you just have to get lucky on the sector time. You're not going to get time. rich levering reasonably. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but I think you got to get the timing right, right? So if you like look pre 2010, energy was like by far one of the best performing buyout sectors for PE. Um, because, you know, they basically, you know, buy stuff when oil was at 20 and then oil would go up to 80 and they'd offload it. And gee, if you, you know, if your revenue went up 4X and you were levered 80%, you know, yeah, you, you look pretty smart. absolute killing. Um, and there were a lot of chemicals deals that followed sort of a similar trajectory. Um, so I think, you know, those volatile areas can work really, really well if you get the timing right. Um, and now how do you get the time? Maybe maybe if you're, let's say not if you get the timing right, if you get lucky on the timing. Um, and so having some exposure to those things, you know, can more than make up for a lot of losses. But, um, but gee, you can, you know, I think as a lot of people, a lot of value investors, you know, myself included, right? Like, you looked at energy in 2016 and said it's cheap. And then you looked at it in 2017 and said it was cheap. And then you looked at it in 2018 and said it was cheap. And like how many years do you have to keep doing something that's getting absolutely smoked and like carried out, you know, in a coffin. Um, and then like by 2020, everyone's like, look at all the cheap energy companies. And you're like, I cannot look at another cheap energy company. <laughs> yeah. right? Like it, it never works. Energy is a terrible sector. And then like all of the energy stocks go up like 5x, right? And maybe you didn't have as much exposure to it because you've gotten so absolutely shellacked on it for the past five years. And that's just how markets work, you know? It's like, um, and, uh, you know, it's it makes them so challenging, especially as a value investor. Yeah, you're the cat that's not going to be sitting on that cold stove either. <laughs> <Yeah>. after. <laughs> there, was a, there was a time in, in the, the long value winter when uh, the, one of the arguments that I heard that I found pretty compelling, and I'm just interested how you think about this, but one of the arguments was there are so many people who know that value work is a factor. There's so much money in value as a factor. All of the value stocks are bid up beyond where 
you should be able to generate any sort of absolute return out of them. And so the true contrarian is now hunting in the most expensive quintile, decile, whatever. And they're taking from that, you know, the better companies out of that most expensive quintile. And the uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Partha Mahanran. I think he's a, he's a professor of finance, possibly in Toronto, I think. And he has the, I think he calls it the growth factor where he would take, it's essentially the same as uh, Pierre Trotsky's F score. I think he called it the G score. It was the F score where you take, rather than taking the cheapest and finding the best and the worst and finding the ones that can survive, you take the most expensive and long, short, traditionally it had generated most of its returns probably as you'd expect from the worst of the most expensive. But there was this period of time through 2019 and 2020 where you know, the, and, and Cliff Asness wrote about this, the fact that things were trading inverse to their fundamentals, which had been a thing that he'd observed in 1999 and 2000 as well. So they're trading inverse to their fundamentals. But he's saying, Path is saying, take the most expensive, the best of the most expensive, had these two phenomenal years through that period of time. And I thought at the time, I remember thinking, this is a, this is a very compelling argument. And here it is. Yeah. It does seem to be working. I, yeah. I don't think it's gone as well since, but what, what do you think? I mean, I think there are other things that work. I mean, it's a matter of your time frame, right? I mean, I think if you look and say, "Hey, I, I have a new, I have a new quant strategy where I only look at 2018 to 2023, and that's where I, you know, derive all the lessons," right? Like, what would you come up? What would you come up with, right? Like, I have no you, idea. You know, say, <laughs> right? You know, single like if, day expiry options. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Shorting ball. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I don't know. Like you come up with some random ideas. Right. And and then you'd say, well, how robust is that? Right. Is that going to work next year? Is that going to work out of sample? Right. If something that's like it's like energy. OK. If it didn't work 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. I, then I'm certain it's not going to work in 2021. And then all of a sudden it does because the world's surprising and it never does what it's supposed to do. And I think that as. Um, you know, people that are trying to make good investment decisions, you know, there's this constant tension between what worked recently and what the sort of long term lessons are. And the people that are, you know, following the long term lessons are always wondering, has something changed? Am I wrong this time? Or can I just can I should I just continue on with what I, you know, generally know works or should work? Right. Um, and I think, you know, within that context, right, the the factor that I think both has worked recently and worked over the long term is, is the quality factor, right? That's why everyone and their mother from the quant world is launching a quality fund or a quality ETF. I think GMO just announced it, right? Like, I mean, because it's it's smart, it's reasonable, it's worked in the long term, it's worked recently, and now it's probably going to stop working randomly right about now because of that. Um, uh, but, you know, I think that, you know, as value investors, that's the tension that we've been living with. And I think, thank God, you know, we had a great, great value years and, um, 2021 and 2022 and for international value investors in 23. Um, uh, but, you know, absent that, you know, you start to come to doubt some of these things. And so I think for me, it's it's how is it that you find the things that you believe in? Um, you know, what are the things that you believe in? How do you come to believe in them? And, and I think for um, some people, right, I think it's, you know, there are a lot of investors that say, if I really know about a company, I can really believe in it, right? I can I can learn everything there is to know about Berkshire Hathaway. And then no matter if Berkshire Hathaway is up or down, I'm still going to own it, right? And so I think part of being a, a good investor is learning about what are the things that, you know, how do you get to belief? Um, because ultimately to win, you got to stick with something for a very long period of time, right? Uh, you, you know, you can't change if, you, if your cons if your strategy is to change your fundamental beliefs every two or three years, like you're definitely going to get destroyed because you're always going to be betting on you're always going to be betting on the thing that worked recently that everyone else is psyched about and that ends up Just crashing. It's not working. Uh, exactly. Um, and I think, you know, for me, and I think for a lot of value investors, it's saying, hey, let's look at this, you know, very long time series over multiple markets. And like, let's really pressure test this. And you say, wow, like the T statistic on these regressions is insane. And like the sharp ratio on this is a long short factor is insane. And the reliability yeah. of this is so strong. Right. And you come to the conclusion that this is like the best thing since sliced bread, which it basically looks like from the quantitative data. Right. Um, and then you live through a period where it doesn't work. You could write a whole book on it. Yeah, yeah. A, maybe several. Uh, exactly. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has done that, but uh, um, but but yeah, I, I think that's sort of where, where where I come to. Right, it's finding out what it is that you believe in and and how it is that you get to belief. I think that's such wise advice because it's it, you're going to be tested on your beliefs, and so if you don't, if you can't, if you don't understand yourself enough to figure out why is this something that you can stick by, 
uh, where the market will absolutely call your bluff on that. Yeah. Just, just changing tack a little bit. Um, Japan has been cheap for a very long time. It's been attractive to value investors probably for a decade or so. But there's been some recent changes where I don't know who the – I think it's the – Nikkei, I don't, I don't actually know who is driving these changes, but there's a requirement that they get – they trade above book value, they undertake some yeah. buybacks. Do you want to let us know what those are? And, yeah, and this is like my favorite, impacted my favorite thing ever, right? Like the government has identified there's a problem, and the problem is the Japanese stocks are too cheap. And the solution is that they're getting really, really mad at all the companies that their stocks are too cheap and they have to publish plans so they're going to not be so cheap in the future. And if they stay cheap, they're going to delist them or they're threatening to delist them. I doubt they'll actually delist anyone. So I just love it, right? I mean, it's just fantastic. It's like, uh, you know, it's like I totally agree. Everything that trades at below book should trade at least at book, right? I'm like, I'm I'm 100% with it. Um now, if, if the U.S. government could pass a mandate, you know, the, the New York section is that everything that trades yeah. above five times book had to trade down to five times book <laughs> you know, to restore rationality to the U.S. market, um, then I'd really be with it. But um, You but wanted I think a catalyst? That, I give you the Ministry of Finance right, in Japan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Uh, and so, and that now I think that, so I, I think that, you know, and then you look at sort of, can they achieve that, right? Like, can these companies actually get to book? And the answer is, yeah, like, they can just increase dividends. Like they have a lot of room to increase dividends, a lot of room to increase buybacks. Um, they have a lot of cash in the balance sheet. Like it's actually, there's a pretty clear path. Um, and uh, so, the, you know, will it happen? I, I don't know, probably not perfectly. <laughs> Nothing's predictable, but, you know, gee, if you're wrong and you bought a big basket of stocks that trade at half times book, you know, you're not going to get hurt falling out of the basement window. I said right before something terrible happens. <laughs> Uh, can't lose. Uh, yeah, I can't, <laughs> I can't lose until tomorrow when you find out that you were you did lose. Um, but uh, because that's the way markets work. But um, but no. So 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 I think that's a really interesting interesting phenomenon, right? And now, and, and I think the other thing that's worth noting, right, is if you look at like we talked about the decrease in quality of U.S. small caps, right? If you look at like any quality metric in aggregate among Japanese small caps, like dividend yield, you know, return on assets, it's like this, right? It. it and it's like the last three years or so, right? Like everything is going in an upward trajectory. Margins are rebounding. Return on assets is increasing. Dividend yields are rising. Like everything is going in the right direction right now in Japan um, for a whole variety of reasons. So I think that- um that, the yes, baseline been, was so bad. <laughs> the baseline was so bad. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so there's a lot of room to to run. Um, so I, I think there's you know a, a great reason to be excited about um, Japan and to feel more comfortable there, and it's a great a great place for uh, micro cap investors because half the market, if not more, is micro cap, um, and it's very liquid. Um, and so there's a lot a lot to like about it from my perspective. I mean, a company could get to one times price to book tomorrow if they wanted by you could you could borrow money and then do a dividend of that exact amount, and you move your book value down to exactly where your market cap is. Yeah, I mean, and I, given the debt is free and there's basically no bankruptcy in Japan, there's pretty much a path for every company to do that. Uh, my impression was that it was having some positive effect that companies were doing these things, doing the buybacks, and I thought that there was some take privates too, where basically they were, you know, back, it was like the '80s again and the US '80s and in Japan in 2023, 2024, where they're basically there are guys who are buying out all of the external shareholders with the cash on the balance sheet of the company, which is like. That's that's my yeah, wet corporate dream. Raiders find something yeah. like that to take. Yeah, there's a lot of that going on. Um, uh, so it, it's an exciting it's an exciting place to be. And uh, finally, um, uh, finally after uh, years of Japan being a boring backwater, um, maybe finally it'll start. Well, I mean, it has been working the last two years, and, and I think there's reason to think it's going to keep working. I've read that uh, some Chinese investors are actually getting money out of China to buy Japanese stocks, which is kind of an interesting. Right. Low. Yeah. And I, I think of, um, you know, where is your money safe internationally? And my 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 joke, we have a colleague who's a, who's a Marine and I joke, if there's a U.S. Marine base in the country, you're probably going to get your money back. Right. Like, and, <laughs> you know, yeah. Japan's got a nice big Marine base. Right. Uh, I yeah. mean, you know, like we can feel pretty safe in most European countries. You're going to get your money back. Right. And, you know, um, Japan, you can feel pretty good. You know, China. I don't know. Yeah. Right? How do you feel about I China? Know. I mean, definitely. <laughs> certainly a lot cheaper than it was uh, two years ago or three years ago. I mean, I think it's 50% off from, yeah. from then. 
Yeah, so we did this big, you know, emerging market crisis investing research, and we we found that you know when a company's when a country's equity market has dropped fifty percent, you know, it tends to be a pretty good investment most of the time. Now we then bifurcated that further and said, gee, you know, there are what we call idiosyncratic crises and there are global crises. Right, an idiosyncratic crisis is it's just that country, like everyone else is doing fine, and just that country is blowing up for some reason. And the results are materially worse in those situations. Mm -hmm. Now, they're still good. Like the base rates are still good, um, but a lot riskier. Whereas the global crises, it's a lot safer, right? You You you, want a global crash. Everything's getting cheaper because everybody's panicking rather than there's a coup. You got it, right? Or they just voted in a new constitution that confiscates property or something, right? Like not a good outcome for you. Um, And so I think, you know, I would say... With China, like now the market has dropped 50%. It's pretty clearly interesting, right? Now, um, I think the fact that it's the only country that's down 50% right now, or you know, one of two or three, you know, makes me nervous um uh because it's self-inflicted and it's self-inflicted, but you know, the people that inflicted this could inflict more. more. There's no reason to think that's gonna stop. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I I think. I think I went from being extremely bearish and never put a dollar in China to more neutral to saying, eh, I don't know. I mean, I think it's probably worth the risk to say, I mean, at least the risk, let me put it differently. The risk is probably fairly priced right now. Um, that doesn't mean it's a perfect investment or a total slam dunk, but it it it's no longer, you're no longer looking at a market where you say, hey, nobody's taking into account the risk that this, you know, X, yeah. Y, or Z could happen. It's like, no, I think people are, right? It's yeah. probably fair. Um, and maybe they've overreacted even a little bit relative to the the existential risk that that truly exists. Right. And, and I think probably, you know, on like a dollar, uh, you know, on a you know U.S. dollar basis is Chinese our Chinese company revenue is going to grow more than U.S. company revenues. Probably. There's probably more growth there, I'd imagine. Um, JT, you got uh, veggies for, for the people. And then I, then I want to come back to a little bit more crisis. The People's crisis Republic of... <laughs> I do. Uh, I, and, uh, you know, I've I've saved this, been saving this segment just because I knew Dan was coming on and it's, uh, it's a little bit more academic. So, um, but this is, uh, it originally came from me sitting there one day, basically staring at my navel and wondering, like, do simpler businesses with shorter 10 Ks actually produce better investment results as a base rate, as opposed to, you know, 800 page proxy, you know, that you have to dig through. Uh, And I did some searching with the help of my friend, Peter. And uh, we discovered that interestingly enough, 10 K file size per se has no return predicting power. However, the change in 10 K file size significantly and negatively predicts future Uh stock returns. So if the 10K size bumps up a bunch, the future there's more earning surprises uh, and more cash flow surprises to the downside that that happen. Um, and this comes from a, a May of 2022 International Review of Finance paper called The Information Content of 10K File Size Change. Uh, and it's by two, I believe, Chinese researchers, and I'll, I'll attempt their names and I'm going to butcher it, but it's uh, Quan Gan and Bihu Kui. Uh, again, I apologize. Um, what they found was that the median length of the annual 10K report uh, that provides the comprehensive disclosures, uh, uh, including the automated financial statements, is more than doubled over the past 10 years. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, already, our 10Ks are twice as long as they were 10 years ago. Uh, I don't know what to make of that exactly. Any any ideas if that's good or bad for your civilization? <laughs> yeah, more shit to dig through. It's it, anytime there's a there's a new disclosure. It's not like a like COVID. So now there's a disclosure for COVID and every single thing. It's not like any other disclosure had to be taken out. You just yeah. it just keeps on accumulating over time. Yeah, these like legal barnacles in the 10K. Yeah, exactly right. Um, so the authors they what they want to empirically investigate does this disclosure length benefit shareholders? And, and they sorted the U.S. stocks into quintile portfolios yearly from 1994 to 2014, uh, according to their most recent 10K file size changes. Uh, then calculated a time series average of equally weighted quintile portfolio returns over the next 12 months. So that's the methodology. Um, and it turns out that uh, you know it's broadly consistent with the managerial disclosure obfuscation explanation. 
uh, which is basically, you know, that dreaded fi- Friday evening dump, you know, where they, <laughs> where they'll just crap out, uh, you know, some, some big material changes and try to hide it in the news flow. Um, but the, it does hold that, um, you know, it typically managers, they tend to release good news in a timely manner and then hide bad news in these vague and noisy disclosures. Uh, and it's the, the more lengthy it is, um, the more likely it is that there's obfuscation and reducing the readability. They looked into that as well. And uh, basically you're, you're burying signals of bad news in, in large amounts of distracting information. So, so there you go. There is a little bit of correlation. Right, it's confirmed. Right. Well, yeah, probably, huh? I, f- I feel like that's right. Um, you t- Tell us a little bit about your crisis strategy. What What's the signal that, uh, turns it on. Yeah. So we look at when high yield spreads go over 600 basis points. This is that um, OAS option adjusted mm-hmm, spread that mm-hmm. Fed publishes. You got so it. Yeah, how how often do you see that? It, so that seems to be, it's a coincident indicator. It seems to, it, it yeah. sort of, it blows out as the, as the uh, crisis sort of gets going and winds on. Yeah. And so when, when typically do you get over 600 basis points. Got to be a lot of stress. Uh, you know, COVID was the last time it happened. Um, and then prior to that in 2015 during the energy, you know, blow up. And then 2011, 12, the Eurozone debt crisis, and then 08. Um, so those are the recent times that's blown out. Um, and I think, you know, there's some really interesting things when when spreads blow out that much. You know, one thing we, we, we've actually just been looking at is, you know, equity momentum as a factor. Um, and if you bifurcate uh, or trifurcate the um, um, history into three states of the world when high yield spreads are below 600, when they're 600 to 1,000 or where they're over 1,000. Um, when spreads are below 600, momentum behaves really normally. It's really positively correlated. You know, Stocks that have been doing well continue doing well. When you go over 600 basis points, momentum stops working. There's just no impact of momentum from 600 to 1,000. And then from like 1,000 over it's like a massive it's negative yeah. massive like like 4x the power of what it was under 600 on the other end so you know there's just huge reversals when stocks go you know when spreads go over a thousand and so generally what you're seeing is when spreads go over 600 they tend to blow way through 600 600 is just a way a way point and they end up going up to you know a thousand or two thousand in the case of 08 um, and then you start to get these interesting effects and you get these big reversal effects that start to happen. Um, you get a huge illiquidity premium, right? Because the high yield spread is a, a real, it's just a direct measure of illiquidity premium essentially, right? Or the, or the small size premium because high yield bonds are the small cap value bonds, the small cap value equivalent in bonds, right? So when the spreads are blowing out, you're just getting a direct indicator of like, wow, value and size are really cheap right now or the, there's a really big premium. Um, and so- you know, if you think that the world's going to kind of come back to normal, which it probably will, um, then you can make a huge killing buying the cheapest, most beaten up stocks when spreads have really blown out. And it's quite reliable um, in a way that's much more reliable than normal times. Did you wonder about the, or at least I wonder, you know, using this kind of this mechanism to turn it on and off. And it's, I think of this like spring that over time started out pretty long. I mean, you know, treasuries at 15%. And now it's the spring has been compressed down to treasuries at zero. And I know that it's the six is the the delta, but does that six, does the significance of the six change as the spring, you know, compression changes at all? Yeah, nothing that I can, nothing that I can observe. I mean, you could Z score it or something, but I I think you're still going to find that 600 is sort of one standard deviation north and kind of always has been. Makes sense. I really like that most recent you guys did on, I thought that was a really clever inversion of what does 7% uh, bond yield buy you as far as credit quality goes. I've, I found that to be, I feel like that's something like Buffett would have done at, at some point and written about. Um, Thank you, Jake. Just, just to show the, the the deterioration and the changes over time of of like credit quality for that same 7% yield. Very, very interesting. Yeah. And yields are, yields are a funny thing. It's like, you know, everyone believes in efficient markets and then you tell them about bonds and then their heads go nuts and they stop realizing that they should be skeptical of anything. And someone says, gee, you know, do you want to, you know, buy this 13% yielding bond? And you say, wow, you know, treasuries only yield five, you know, great, yeah. like sign me up. I mean, I want to love to get a 13% yield. 
Um, and and then the person selling it's like, and it's a contract, so you're guaranteed to get your money back because yeah, everybody it's, it's always printed. honors their contract. On the coupon, <laughs> it tells you exactly how much you're going to get. <laughs> uh, and and you sort of say, well, if efficient market theory were true, shouldn't all bonds, no matter the yield, have the same expected return? Right? I mean, like, right? Like, let's let's have a little bit of skepticism here, but um, but you know, again, normally smart investors, for whatever whatever reason, often lose their heads when it comes to bonds. So I think the message we're trying to get across is like, you know, target a target a credit quality or target the exposure you want. Don't don't get focused on the yield. It's going to mislead you. Um, you're going to make you know, bad decisions if you just start thinking in terms of yield. But, you know, you look at the private credit industry and and they've realized that, you know, people are suckers for a big promised yield. Um, but, you know, you look at past instances where people have offered very high yield products, right? It's it's not like, I mean, how many, how many um, you know, billionaire pawn shop payday lenders do you know versus how many, you know, billionaire PIMCO type people do you know, right? Like, turns out it's a lot better to buy the less risky bonds than the really, 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 really risky ones. Fool's yield, as you've called it before. Exactly. Yeah. How, how do you implement the uh, the the high yield credit? Is that the is that the way that you're doing it? You're, he promises thirteen percent. <laughs> yeah, promises thirteen percent. We raise as much money as we can. <laughs> I like it so far. One, two terms Go. of leverage, and, yeah. and then yeah, we add a little leverage on top, and then if it stops working, we raise a new fund and buy the bad debt from the old fund. No, at a um, discount so far so good <laughs> um so so basically i think you know it's like factor investing anywhere else except you you have you're given the value right like right right away you're you're given that so what you really want to know is controlling for the yield what's the quality right um and so you're really basically you're just in, in in inverting it in some way what you do in an equity world and so and it turns out that in terms of um uh, bond market, some of these things are, it's actually a little bit simpler, right? Like, so one of the key things that you want, you, you really want in credit is size at a given yield. So if you have two bonds that both yield 7%, um, and one of them has a billion dollars of market cap, and one of them has 15 billion of market cap, you really want the company with 15 billion of market cap. It's much more likely to get upgraded to investment grade. It's much less likely to go bankrupt. Um, and you know, similarly, return on assets, for example, or gross profit to assets, those types of metrics. You know, if it's you have quality, the same yield, yeah. gee, you'd much rather choose the company with a 10% ROA than a 2% ROA. Um, and if you stack up a few of those pretty simple, pretty obvious metrics, and then you just rank the bonds by yield, and then, you know, uh, so you take all the bonds that are given yield bracket, rank them by quality. You know you're going to get a really good clean um, uh, 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 premium relative to the index, and that's what we do. It's a it's a very simple uh, approach, um, but it's very powerful. And and I think you know one of the things that's interesting about credit is it's more predictable than stocks. Um, um, these things work more reliably in debt than in equities. Um, and so you know I think you can um, you can see these factor premiums more reliably there. It, and it's, it's an just... equity type approach to to bonds. Mm -hmm. Higher credit, sort of more equity than the non. Sorry, JT. I was just going to say is that the uh, and there's like a kind of a sweet spot at like double B. Is that yeah I exactly? So there's that, a right? there's a there's a level at which yield. So increasing yield um, improves your total return up until the low end of double B, and then increased yield actually decreases your total return, which we call fool's yield. Like it's it's this triangle where like a 15% yielding bond actually returns worse than a 6% yielding bond on average, right? So you find that sort of fulcrum point where your yield, um, you're, you're maximizing total return, not maximizing yield. And then with at that yield point, you sort by quality. That That's essentially our strategy. Um, but, you know, what's this fool's yield concept is really fascinating, right? It turns out that like no one really knows how to price an 18%. Like if, if someone's, it's an 18% yield, what's the bankruptcy risk? Is it 33% or 28%? Strong like, it's to just quite too, strong. It's just like, it's, it's probably going to go bankrupt. And and probably there are too many idiots that thought an 18% yield sounds really good. I'm going to go buy that, right? And so it ends up being that that stuff ends up kind of ending up with shitty outcomes. Um, whereas the much higher quality stuff is just more consistent, does better over time. This might be a state secret, but how does Dan get the data for all of his bonds? Uh, you know, you can get a lot of data from Capital IQ, um, has like the last 10 years of bonds pretty well. Um, and then anything other than that, Bloomberg is the only really reliable. You, you kind of have to trade bonds. You really need Bloomberg. Um, uh, Do you want to tell us a little bit about the multi-strat 
that's fund is that that's launched or that's just launched? Yeah. Yeah, we we launched it about two years ago. So uh, it's it's we 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 we've, we've changed it. Um, we, we we tried some things that didn't work, and then we've um, we've really uh, been improving the model. Um, but what we what we've sort of come to is that you know I think a lot of investors are very focused on expected return, right? You want to maximize your expected return, but expected return is also really hard to predict, as we've talked about, right? It's really hard to know if you like take every stock and try to rank them by expected return, which is sort of what all equity investors are trying to do. It's really, really hard. And if you look at like the R squared on factors, right? How well factors predict um, the expected return for stocks, you, you know, you're getting in the, you know, five to 10% R squared range, right? Like it's a real edge, but it's a, a it's lot of noise. Much, yeah. It's a lot of noise. It's not much. Uh, it's really hard to predict. Um, and what we've learned is that actually what's much easier to predict is correlations and volatility. Um, so if you just take a weighted average correlation matrix, right? You, you say, hey, like, let's ha give it a half life of like a month or three months um, and look at the correlations between stocks and bonds and oil and value and size and whatever, that that correlation matrix is pretty stable. On I mean, it changes over time, but you can predict next month's correlations pretty well with that sort of weighted half-life type history of recent correlation matrices, such that the R squared on that might be, you know, it's hard to think of what an R squared means for a correlation matrix, but if you think of some equivalent, you know, you're probably getting into like 70 or 80% R squared. Like you can really predict correlations pretty darn well by relying on trunk relations. And then volatility is also really predictable, right? So um, uh, last month's volatility, you take in the VIX and you take in recent, like last month's volatility, you you can get a 40 or 50% R squared predicting next month's equity volatility. And, and if you try to predict bond volatility and oil volatility and whatever, you're going to get pretty good at that too, right? It's just pretty auto-correlated. It's pretty, you know, it moves a lot, but it's auto-correlated. Um, so if you say, well, gee, let's imagine I can't say, I have no view on expected returns. Like I think stocks return what they long-term averages. I think bonds return long-term average. I think oil returns long-term average. Right? Everything just has a long-term average return. Um, or, so I think the market follows a random walk, right? I have no view of anything. But I think that volatility and correlations move around a lot. And you run that through an optimizer, you're going to get very different portfolios every different month, right? Because stocks and bonds, if stocks and bonds are really highly correlated, you know, gee, you're going to take down your exposure to one or the other because you don't need both. Um, and if stock volatility goes up a lot, right, uh, um, and you have the same expected return forecast, then your sharp your forecast of sharp dramatically went down. So you're going to say, well, gee, I want to take down my equity allocation, not because I have not because I have any negative view on equities, right? I have the same expected return view, but for that volatility, I, they're just less of a good buy right now, right? I'm just getting less sharp for the same you know, uh, uh, products, I'm going to reduce my weight and maybe I'll take it up in something that's less volatile than normal. Uh, and so what we started is basically building this giant um, uh, database of every single stock um, categorized by factor, bonds, both sovereign and corporate with factors, and then commodities, oil, copper, gold, and cur currencies, you know, the major tradable currencies, and saying, hey, let's run an optimizer where we look at their volatility and correlation structures. You take some rough bench, regularized to some rough, you know, 60, 40 like benchmark and then say, gee, can I improve outcomes because I'm really good at predicting volatility and correlations? And the answer is, gee, yes, you can. You can really, really dial up sharp and you'll take bets that, you know, you might be really, you know, for, for example, you know, right now we're um, we're quite short the Mexican peso. We have no view on the Mexican peso, right? We, 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 in fact, our model is told that the Mexican peso is a 0% expected return always, right? Like we'd never have a view. It just happens that right now the Mexican peso is really negatively correlated with a lot of bets that we want to take, right? So we, we like value and it turns out that the Mexican peso, you know, when value does well, the Mexican peso does badly or something, right? So it ends up loading up on the Mexican peso to diversify our value long, right? And you're like, I never would have thought of that. Like I, that's totally nuts to me. <laughs> but like sense it's what i've been missing yeah, it's what we've been all been missing clearly <laughs> um but you know the when you think of why it did that it actually makes a lot of sense right and it, it actually works decently well so what we've been trying to build is and, and then we've said okay well gee now what if we could actually predict have some edge and expected return right is there some way where we, we can make better expected return forecasts and we looked at you know everything we could try to predict can we time value can we time size can we time treasuries can we time high yield and for 90% of things, we found that we couldn't. 
no ability nothing we came up with we threw the kitchen sink at it nothing worked at a sample just all a failure right like we have no ability to predict whether japan's going to do better in the u.s next month we have no ability to predict the u.s equity intercept but for some things they are predictable or more predictable um so momentum, right? I just described to you how equity momentum works really well under 600 basis points, not well between 600,000 and as reversals over a thousand. You plug that in, you're actually a big improvement in your ability to forecast momentum returns. Um, and then you can apply a sort of similar logic. Um, one of the logic we talked about with high yield spreads is size. You know, when high yield spreads go, when they're, when they're going widening, blowing out, you know, size does worse. And when they're coming in, size does better. Um, and when spreads are really wide, size does better. When they're really tight, size does worse. So, you know, you, and then, gee, you can actually get like a 10% R squared in predicting the size premium, um, for example. Um, and then, you know, oil is another example where oil is really driven by high yield spreads. When high yield spreads blow out, oil sells off. When high yield spreads come in, oil does well. When high yield spreads are just bumping around, oil just goes randomly, oscillates in a dramatically unpredictable way. Um, but, um, but you know, you you start to layer on all of these things and you accumulate all of them into rules and you write software to trade them. Um, that's what we're trying to build um, is to try to build all these insights into a, a, a basically software that can tr trade all of these ideas and understand the volatility and correlation matrix across, you know, 39 you know, correlation pairs. And um, that's, that's, that's the essence of what we're trying to do, which I'm, I'm pretty excited about. It's been a huge, huge research effort, both building out the infrastructure to do it, you know, doing all the research and then, and then learning how to actually trade it and how to make it work. Did you say that the higher oil prices correlate with uh, high yield spreads or is it the other there? Is it positive or negative? Um, correlation? It's the change in spreads predicts. Uh, changes in the price of oil. So when spreads are widening out, oil sells off, and when they're tightening, um, interesting. I would have so, probably thought the opposite of that. Actually, like I've heard, you know, the idea that that oil is perhaps its own kind of Fed funds rate. Like so, when it spikes, that's kind of like often kills kills the economy when oil yeah, so, price spikes. Yes. Yeah, so, so we're saying the same thing. So right when when high yield spreads blow out, the economy is doing badly. Or, or starting, you know, it's, it's predicting the economy is doing worse. Growth is slowing. And that's when oil starts to sell off and do really badly. I think we're saying the same thing. Well, I was actually a spike in oil prices precedes. You're, you're saying it's causal. Uh, yeah. Like it precedes a, a economic, uh, you know, hiccup. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I, I haven't, I haven't seen, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't, um, I, I've tried that and I didn't see the <laughs> very work, yeah. strong relationship, but, but the opposite that oil as a contemporaneous thing, when the economy starts to slow or do badly, that oil sells off, which makes a total sense that it would. Um, and that actually makes it a really good hedge against equities. Right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, because it's one of the things that, you know, you, you can short oil um, when high yield spreads start blowing out and it's really a beautiful, a beautiful hedge. Do you have any worries about, with all these correlations, I have kind of a call it Taleb's Turkey kind of problem where, you know, it seems like these things are all working and then you have like a huge reversal that kind of like, you know, give back 10 years worth of it working. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I think that, um, I think that from what we've seen, correlations are pretty stable. Not they change, but they're auto correlated. They're pretty auto correlated. Right. Um, and relying on last month's correlations to predict next month's correlations seems pretty reasonable. So then the question is like, are there big jumps where correlations yeah, just dramatically, yeah. dramatically change? Um, and, you know, one way to test that is to like use the VIX to predict a correlation matrix or something or predict. And I think what you find is that you don't really need to do that because the markets, you know, like even during COVID, the correlations are changing, um, but um, but you can adjust with the you know just even adjusting on a weekly basis you're going to be fine mm -hmm. um if you're reacting to those variables in other ways right the same thought occurred to me but i was wondering whether it was it's something you can deal with the way that you're allocating your assets to the extent to which you have leverage and you have derivatives have got leverage in them you can probably find a way to construct it without without that being concerned but that was the thought that i had if there's always there's there's no free lunches i think it's just the is probably the, the first rule of finance that there's there's a cost somewhere, and it may be that it's something that has that sort of behavior that Jake described. That yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Behavior. I think that's probably the right risk to be thinking about. But I, I think fundamentally, if you're just saying, "Hey, I'm diversifying across multiple asset classes," and the other thing that I'm doing is that when volatility spikes, I reduce my exposure, um, 
because yeah. I think the sharp ratio has changed. I'm very humble by my expected return forecasts. Most of those discontinuities should be accompanied by spikes in vol. And so if you have a model that really dramatically de-risks every time vol spikes, you know, yeah. um, probably, you know, I think there's there's less risk of, of getting totally destroyed, um, uh, especially if your you know, bets are diversified across multiple asset classes. But um, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll find out. Um, find out together. <laughs> and on that note, Dan, we've just come up on time. So if uh, folks want to follow along with what you're doing or get in contact with you, what's the best way of doing that? Uh, my Twitter at VerdadCap, and you can sign up through my Twitter bio to our weekly research. I would encourage that. Uh, it's Dan Rasmussen, Verdad Capital. Thanks very much for your time today. Thanks to everybody else too. Um, JT, we'll be back next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. See you folks.